All right, we're going to sing hymn number 269, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Let's stand and sing together. can shake thy sure repose with salvation's wall surrounded thou mayest smile at all thy foes see the streams of living waters springing from me eternal love well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove Who can faint while such a river Ever flows their thirst of swage Says which like the Lord, the giver Never fails from age to age Round each habitation hovering See the cloud and fire appear For a glory and a covering Showing that the Lord is near Thus delivering from their banner Light by night and shade by day Safe they feed upon the manna which he gives them when they pray. Savior, if of Zion's city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all is boasted by and shown. Solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. Our text for this afternoon is John's Gospel, chapter 9, and verses 13 to 34. It's a long one today. John chapter 9, verses 13 to 34. The apostle writes, They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes, and I washed, and I see. And therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him, since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been born blind and had, or that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How, then how does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that it is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, 
he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. So a second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And then he answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? And they reviled him. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he's from. Then the man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he will hear him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you are teaching us. So they put him out. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, we've been taking a look the past couple of weeks at this beautiful portion of Scripture in John chapter 9. And we've seen the beauty of Christ in it and the divinity of Jesus Christ displayed for us in living color through his miracle of making new eyes for a man who had spent his life entirely in darkness, totally and completely blind. And Jesus, through an act of creation reminiscent of the creation of man in Genesis, he takes the dust of the ground and he forms it and puts this mud on the man's eyes and tells him, go to the pool of Siloam, which means scent, and wash. And the man went and he washed his eyes and he came back seeing. What a truly stupendous miracle this was. It was so unprecedented. It was so mind-boggling that the people who used to see the man sitting and begging for money year after year by the temple, they could not believe their eyes as they see this man now, with eyes open, no longer needing a walking stick, no longer needing someone to guide him by the arm, no, no longer uh, begging on the side of the road, but rather looking at everything, looking at the people and the clouds and the buildings and the trees and the animals that line the street, looking, gazing, and all of his friends, of course, were saying, what happened? The man who was called Jesus, he made clay and he put it on my eyes and I went and I washed and now I can see. Oh, how this was utterly transformative for him. It changed every single thing about this man's life. It brought him quite literally out of darkness and into light. His original condition, as we've been learning, was indeed so obvious that there, there were those there who could not even believe that it was the same person. Perhaps this man is a doppelganger. <laughs> you know that word, doppelganger? Like it's a, a, a doppelganger, somebody who's, who looks just like you, like a twin, but you're not related. Perhaps that's what's happening, they think. Maybe he has a look-alike, but he kept saying to everybody, I'm the man. It was me. Jesus did this for me. Jesus did. The text says he kept saying it. 
He kept saying it over and over. I'm the man. I'm the man. It was me. Christ did it for me. And the people were so shocked that they decided to bring this man to the religious leaders of Israel, to, to bring him to the Pharisees. Surely by showing the Pharisees the condition of this man now, they would then believe that Jesus is who he says he is. The text says they brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind, now it was a Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. You might be thinking, why did the man's neighbors cause him this trouble, though? Why would they want to bring him to the Pharisees? Did they want him to be in trouble? Did they want Jesus to be in trouble? I don't think so. Actually, since Jesus was causing such a stir in Jerusalem, especially at the temple which is where the man was sitting at the entrance to the temple, that I think probably what more likely was happening is that they were bringing this man to the Pharisees to prove to them that Jesus was actually able to do miraculous signs. And as we'll see, it was common knowledge that the Pharisees hated Jesus. So, so I believe that this man's friends or neighbors, they wanted to show them, show the religious leaders, look, Look at what Jesus is able to do. But it was a Sabbath. And even this was a stumbling block to them, which the leaders of Israel tried to use against the Lord. Look at verses 15 to 17. Then the Pharisees also were asking him again how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. It's very simple. Let me just pause here for a second. His testimony is so simple. This is what Jesus did for me. That's it. He applied clay to my eyes. I washed. I can see now. That's it. And therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Just think about that for a second. That word, therefore. What did he do for you? He put clay on my eyes. Therefore, he can't be from God. Because he picked up clay. And if you pick up clay on the ground and you put it on somebody's face, well, that's working, isn't it? He's doing this thing on the Sabbath. I do. <laughs> There's... There were some people who were killed for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. There's nobody who is judged in the Bible for picking up dust on the Sabbath and putting it on somebody's eyes. Okay, nobody, nobody. It says, therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was division among them. And so they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. The blind man gave a clear testimony. As I mentioned before in a previous sermon, there has never been a textbook, a medical textbook ever written in history that prescribes a mud mask as treatment for congenital blindness. <laughs> All right? There's no such thing as that. No, what Jesus did was most assuredly a bona fide, undeniable miracle of God. And they could not deny that if that was true what jesus did was true they could not deny that it was a miracle since they couldn't deny it was a miracle they tried to do the next best thing they tried to deny that it was the man <laughs> right? not that the miracle didn't happen but that there there is no such man as a blind man a, a man who was born blind that's what they tried to do but i'm getting i'm getting ahead of myself Jesus does this marvelous thing. And all that some of the Pharisees could do was accuse Jesus of breaking the Sabbath once again. You know, they had accused him of breaking the Sabbath before. That was the original reason in John's Gospel for why the Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus, the reason that they wanted to kill Jesus was because he healed the man at 
Bethesda on the Sabbath. And he said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. The man did that for that reason, John 5 tells us, they were seeking to kill him. And then when Jesus says, my father's working and I am working, then they wanted to kill him all the more because he was equating himself with God. So this is now at least the second time that Jesus does something wonderful on the Sabbath day. And these men are so angry about it. Their reasoning went like this. God tells us not to do work on the Sabbath. But since Jesus is doing miracles on the Sabbath, he must not be from God because miracles are work. That's what they're saying. Miracles are work. <laughs> but, but there's a little problem with that, isn't there? There are no classified ads in the newspaper for miracle worker. Have you ever seen one like that? You ever, well, nobody gets a newspaper now anyway. But back when there used to be newspapers and there were classifieds in the newspaper, right? There was never any classified that said, we're looking for a miracle worker. Why? Well, because the average Joe can't just perform miracles. That's why. That's why. Mm. The fact that Jesus was doing God-glorifying miracles on the Sabbath as signs of his identity did not mean that he was breaking the Sabbath. It meant that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. That's what it meant. It were, these were signs of his identity as Lord and Christ. And there were even some of the Pharisees who could not argue with this. They're saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs, plural? It's because they had seen him do other things. They had heard the reports about Jesus. Perhaps they'd heard the report about Jesus turning water into wine. They'd heard the report about Jesus healing the man at Bethesda. They hear this report now about Jesus putting mud on the congenitally blind man's eyes. And now he has brand new eyes that see. They cannot deny it. How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs, they say. That's exactly right. Only the Lord could open the eyes of the blind. But since there was a division among the ranks of the leaders of Israel, they asked the blind, the formerly blind man himself, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. Yes, indeed. And more than that, he's the Lord of glory. Now, we should not think of the formerly blind man's statement saying that he's a prophet to mean that uh, he therefore did not believe Jesus to be the Christ. He just didn't know enough yet about the Lord's identity to make that statement. He did not know enough yet. He I, it seems like he was looking at Jesus as a prophet of the sort of like Elijah or Moses, someone from the Old Testament scripture. As a matter of fact, that's what other people really did believe about him. When Jesus asks in Mark 8, when he asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? They said to him, some say John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. And he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus then says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal these things to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So this man, it seems, had at the very least an idea that Jesus is a prophet. Perhaps Elijah come back down from heaven or one of the others, but this is the answer that he gives. He's a prophet. And we might also say this um, very rightly as Christians today. Jesus is Christ and Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. We can also say Jesus is indeed a prophet. He is. He fulfills the prophetic office. The words that he speaks are the words of God. That's what a prophet does. He proclaims the words of God. Jesus indeed 
is a prophet. He's the greatest prophet. He's the one who speaks all of the words of God. He is the incarnate word of God. But he's not wrong when he says that Jesus is a prophet. Hmm. This man knew this. That the miracle that Jesus did was a sure attestation of Jesus being sent from God. That's why signs are called signs. Because they point to something. They point. I'm teaching this to the kids in seventh, my seventh grade Bible class. Like, what are signs? Signs are things that point to something else. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon. Anybody here ever been to the Grand Canyon before? As you're going to the Grand Canyon, you'll see these brown signs and they have like little artwork on them that shows like a canyon on it. And it says, as you get closer and closer, Grand Canyon this way, 50 miles ahead, Grand Canyon, right? That's what it shows. What is it? It's, it's a sign. It points you to the thing. It points you to where you want to go. That's what Jesus' miracles are. That's what John calls the miracles of Jesus. He calls them signs. Signs that point to who he is. In this case, the sign pointed to Jesus being from God. But that was not the answer that the Pharisees wanted to hear. What about you? Who do you say he is? He's a prophet. No, we're going we're gonna to ask your parents if you're really the person. That's, that's what they say. It took a different tack, this time accusing the man of not being the man. Accusing him of not actually being blind. And, and perhaps if he is the man, then he wasn't really blind. Or maybe this is just an imposter, somebody who looks like the man. So they took this very unusual step of bringing in the man's parents to question them and bring them before the Inquisition. Look at verses 18 to 23. The Jews then did not believe it of him. Wait, 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 wait. Why didn't they believe it of him? Because he said he's a prophet. That's why they didn't believe him. If he would have said, he's a noble Joe, he's a doctor, he's whatever, they would have been like, okay, that's fine. The fact that, they, that he said he's a prophet, that's why they didn't believe him. They did not believe it of him that he had been blind and that he had received sight. Until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. And they questioned them, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. The parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed. And when it says Jews, what it means there, the way that John uses this, as a reminder, when John uses the word Jews, of course, John himself is Jewish. He's talking about the Jewish leadership. The Jews, the Jewish leadership, had already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. And it was for this reason that the parents said, he is of age. Ask him. I feel bad for these parents. I feel bad for them. In a time when they should have been feasting and rejoicing that their boy, their boy can see that Jesus had done this wonderful thing for their son. Instead of that, they have to face the inquisition of the leaders of the nation. And, and they were suddenly filled with the fear of man because they did not want to lose access to the religious life of Israel. And, and I know, I know that, you know, we could take the tack of saying, oh, well, they should have stood up to them and, you know, should have just said, hey, I know. Well, I don't think they were there. The Bible doesn't say that they were there when Jesus healed the man. They had heard 
And we know that they had heard that it was Jesus because the, the text says the reason they didn't say it was Jesus is because they're afraid. Right. So they had heard it, but they were not eyewitnesses. They did not know for sure. And so instead, they they said, this is indeed our son and he was born blind. But how he sees, we do not know who opened his eyes. We do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. In their answer, they shrewdly say, in essence, why are you asking us? We weren't there. Our son's old enough to answer. So they called for this man once again. And, and then, friends, what ensued was nothing short of a master class in how to answer fools according to their folly. Just remarkable. Just wonderful. Look at verses 24 to 27. So a second time, they call in the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And then he answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he <laughs> answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? Ha <laughs> ha! I really love this guy. I love him. I really want to dig into this for a moment. How twisted are these religious leaders that they would think much less say, that they would think much less say, that giving glory to God meant accusing Jesus of being a sinner. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. Once again, I'm reminded of the words of Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter that verse perfectly represents what is going on here. They told the man that giving glory to God meant calling the Holy One of Israel a sinner. Actually, as I was meditating on this passage, um, I was suddenly reminded of a chapter of the scripture in the Torah, Numbers 22, where Balak the king of Moab tried to hire Balaam to curse the children of Israel. And he even offered him money to do so. But Balaam replied, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. And then in Numbers 23 verse 8, Balaam says this, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? That's it. When these people, these wretches in the garb of religiosity, when these wretched men say, give glory to God, just confess that this man is a sinner. He, the... Formerly blind man is, he's, he's like Balaam here. He's, I can't, I can't. What do you mean? I can't do that. I will not do that. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? How could the formerly blind man have spoken ill of the one who brought him from darkness and into light? Do you know, that's the reason why the apostle says that n no one who is born of the Spirit, can say, Jesus be cursed. And nobody can. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit. This is why. This is the reason why. Because if Christ has saved you, you cannot denounce him. You cannot curse him. You cannot accuse him of doing evil. He's the opposite of evil. He's the personification of good. He is the personification of righteousness and holiness and truth and love and mercy and justice and, and peace and, and all of the good things that you could ever choose to say about him. He is the personification of all of that. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. That's Jesus. 
How, how dare these people say that he's a sinner? How dare they? How dare they try to bring Jesus down to the level of that they are at? They cannot do so. Absolutely not. And when they tried, well, this guy here, he had quite enough of their shenanigans. <laughs> that was it. He had, he had quite enough. He saw right through their nonsense. Look at what he tells them in verse 25. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That's what I know. That's all he needed to know. That's all he needed to know. Uh, really, friends... There's a sense in which that's all we need to know. Though I was blind, now I see. I don't know the answer to all theological mysteries. I, I don't. I don't know everything. Uh, there's far, far more about the Bible that I don't know than the stuff that I do know. <laughs> I feel like even every time, every time I come up and like give a message, how unworthy I am. Uh, be, I, I feel like all I can ever do in giving a, the, a, a sermon in the scripture is, is at best faithfully scratch the surface of the Bible. That's it. That's, that's like, I think that's all any preacher can ever really do is faithfully scratch the surface of the Bible. But thank God, I actually don't need to know every mystery. I know this. I once was blind, but now I see. Christ has delivered me out of darkness, and he's brought me into his marvelous light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what he's brought me into. Has he brought you out of darkness and into his marvelous light? Has he done that for you? Can you say, as this man said, one thing I know, one thing I know, I once was blind, but now I see. It's all that he needed. Jesus miraculously healed him. He had spent his life in the dark, in darkness, and now he saw the light and the, the truth of his response to the leaders of Israel is so sublime. I once was blind, but now I see that 17 centuries later, John Newton put those words to music. Those beautiful words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind. But now I see. Isn't that our testimony? Isn't that the testimony of every single Christian who ever lived in the last 2,000 years? I once was blind, but now I see. Has he brought you out from death to life and from blindness to sight? All you need to know is that Jesus is the all-sufficient Savior and Lord. That's enough. Enough for me that Jesus saves. This ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I come to me, to him. He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And so this man gives them his answer that he knows this one thing. He was blind, but now he sees. And they ask him once again then, once again, how did he do it? How did he open your eyes? Did he perform surgery on you? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it Again, you do not want to become his disciples too, do you? <laughs> look, look at the boldness of this guy. He's so bold. It's like they keep asking about Jesus. How 
Did Jesus do it? How did he do it? How did he do the miracle? Over and over they keep asking him, surely this must be a sign that they are interested in following him. Or as Shakespeare put it in Hamlet, thou doth protest too much, methinks. Right? That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. Oh, you keep asking over and over. I love to tell the story to those who know it best. <laughs> That's what this man is saying. Wow, you want to hear it again? I'll tell you again. Maybe the reason you want to keep hearing about Jesus is because you're a Christian. Is that true? Are you really a Christian? <laughs> That's what he's saying to them. Oh, I think he knew that this answer would provoke them. It does. As I said, this man is showing exactly how to answer such fools. He knows that they hate Jesus. And so he exposes their hatred by pointing out their obsession. That's what he's doing. And this only infuriates them more. Look at what they do. Verse 28 and onward. And they reviled him. And they said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's come from. The man answered and said to them, well, here is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from. And yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. It's such brilliant argumentation. It's so brilliant. Surely God had to have given him these words. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins and you're teaching us? It's their answer. It's the best answer that they have. Who would ever hear a person who says, I can open your eyes. You're a blind person. I can open your eyes. God wouldn't hear such a person unless God were with that person and that person were with God. They have no answer for that. They cannot reply to him at all. All they can do is kick him out. All they can do is say, you don't have a PhD. Who are you? You are born in sins. Get out of here. Never come back. You're put out of the synagogue forever. Now the mask comes off. The Greek word in verse 28 for reviled literally means that they heaped insults on him. See, see, it was not cold intellectual detachment that these Pharisees were displaying here. Oh, the world wants you to think that. Oh, I'm just above all of that Bronze Age nonsense. That's it. I'm above all of it. Uh, I'm, I'm a 21st century man. I'm above that kind of I, these ridiculous ideas. This was not cold intellectual detachment that they display here. This is not calm, uh, scientific view of the truth. Here is passion. The, here is indignation and raging malice and spite. That is what we see from the Pharisees. Raging malice and spite. Not intellect. Their main problem, we can see from the text itself, their main problem is not an intellectual problem. It is a problem of the black hardness and hatred of their heart. That's the problem. And that's all of our problem by nature. That is all of our problem. That's it. That's the problem with mankind. It's not that he doesn't have access to the knowledge. It, that, it's that he doesn't want the knowledge. Here's the proof. Literally standing in front of them. The man. He can now see. His parents say, this is our boy. This is him. 
He did this miracle. Jesus did this miracle to him. And though the miracle, I mean, the miracle was literally looking them in the eyes. It's a miracle. <laughs> Think about this. They're actually looking at a miracle in the eyes because the miracle was the man's eyes. That is the miracle. Right? They're looking the miracle in his eyes and they stubbornly refuse to believe. And all they can do, their best weapon, is to revile him, to heap insults upon him, to be filled with rage, to say, how dare you try to teach us? We can't answer what you say, but you shouldn't be trying to teach us. That's it. That's it. Defeated. <laughs> like, like, that's it. They're defeated. They're defeated. If they would have bowed their stiff knees and their stiff necks, then they could have been healed as well. They could have been saved too. Even Pharisees could be saved if they would just humble themselves and ask Christ for forgiveness. Jesus would give that to them. We, we see here in this text the true irrational nature of unbelief. It is irrational. And they cannot answer it. They cannot answer the truth. I was saying this morning <clears throat> to the members of my church, I was telling them that, I mean, Jesus isn't even present here in this argument. I mean, he, he, he may be present through the spirit giving the man the words. I don't know. But, but he's not even present here. And the man doesn't even yet know that Jesus is the son of man. Because Jesus is going to tell him that, Lord willing, next week when we get to that section of John 9. The end of John 9. Jesus explains to him. Say that again. Two weeks, sorry. Two weeks from now. Two weeks from now. Um... But they cannot answer even this man. That's the, re the reason why is because uh, 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 they, they cannot stand for the truth. They do not love the truth. They believe the lie because they belong to the father of lies. So that when the truth is staring them in their face, they will not receive it. They cannot receive it. They have to push it down. They have to revile the truth. They have to kick the truth out of the synagogue. They have to get rid of it. Push it. Suppress it. Or... or like Paul says in Romans 1, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Like, isn't that what we see right here in the text? They are suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, heaping, hurling insults at these people. Like, I mean, at this man. Like, why? Why does he, why do they do that? What's the reason for it? Man did not insult them. He just told them. Look, you guys keep asking. It sounds like you want to be his disciple. You're his disciple. We hate him. We don't like him. We don't want him. We don't want to know him. We believe Moses. We don't believe Jesus. Nah, the problem is they don't believe Moses either because Moses is the one who wrote about Jesus. They don't believe him either. Amazing. And then they say this really interesting thing. They say, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. Isn't that something? Just a few hours earlier, as recorded in John 8, 48, these people said to Jesus, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They said that to Jesus. Do we not rightly say you're a Samaritan? But here they say, we don't know where he's from. So which is it? Is he a demon-possessed Samaritan? Or do you not know where he's from? It's no wonder later on at Jesus' trial that the leaders of the nation could not get their witnesses to agree. They could not even get their own thoughts straight about him. All they knew 
was their hatred of the Lord. We don't know where this fellow was from, they say. But then, look at the most wonderful reply from this man who was formerly blind. Verse 30, the man answered and said to them, Well, here is an amazing thing. That you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Wow, this guy's my hero. I just have to say, this man in John 9, he's my hero. His words contain impeccable logic. Who can argue against it? Jesus did a thing which no one else in history could ever do. And no matter the threats of powerful men, no matter the loss of religious privileges, no matter what the cost, this man is going to stand on the truth of Christ and what Christ did for him. His parents were afraid of the Pharisees, but he's not afraid. He's not afraid, not even one bit. He knows that his words are going to get him into trouble with these men. But he does not care about that at all. He does not care at all. He stands on the truth of the gospel no matter what it costs him. There's a lesson for us in this room about that. There's a lesson for us. Do you know that... It's not some small thing to be cast out of the synagogue, okay? It's not small. The synagogue is the center of the religious life of the nation of Israel. It's the center. I mean, the temple is as well. But, but the synagogue is the, the meeting place of the people of Israel, the people of God. To be cast out, to be excommunicated. It, it was, in essence, these men, in essence, were saying... About this man, you are like a dog. You are like a Gentile dog. Get away from us. We'd want nothing to do with you anymore. Casting him out. In the Pharisees' view, them casting a person out of the synagogue was casting them out of the kingdom of heaven. But this man knew better. He knew better. They could cast him out of the synagogue, but they could not cast him out of the kingdom of heaven. They could not, because the one who healed him, he's the king of heaven. Amen. Amen. No one, no one but Jesus could tell him to go away. But Jesus says that those who come to him, he'll never cast out. He'll never cast them out. Isn't that amazing? He stands on the truth of Christ, no matter what the cost. I mean, if you really think about it, what could these Pharisees do to him that he had not already been through anyway? <laughs> For real. What, what could they do? It's, it's like their, their threats uh, to Lazarus in John chapter 12. Where, ha, ah, we want to kill Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead. Like, when Lazarus he hears that, I'm sure Lazarus is thinking like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> Send me back to heaven, I guess. <laughs> right? I've been there, done that. You know, if you want to kill me, go ahead and kill me then. <laughs> He's not afraid. He's not afraid. That's what Jesus says. Do not fear him who can kill the body and do no more. Rather, fill him who has the power to throw both body and soul into hell. That's what's happening here. And this man casts his lot with Jesus, no matter what the cost. All the, these leaders can do is further revile him and put him out of the synagogue. And they answered him and they say, you were born entirely in sins, and you are teaching us? So they put him out. Oh, if only they would have allowed themselves to be taught by this man. They say, you were born in sins, and you're teaching us? How dare you teach us? Ah, man, I wish they would have been taught. 
by the man. I wish they would have listened to his words. But I want you to notice something here at the end that I only realized as I was writing this sermon. Do you remember how the chapter starts? Look back at the beginning of John chapter 9. Look at how the chapter starts. The disciples asked Jesus, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened, that the work of God might be displayed in him. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned to cause his blindness. But look at what the Pharisees say to him as they cast him out of the synagogue. They say, you were born entirely in sins. Isn't that fascinating that they would say that? It was the question that the disciples asked, who sinned? Jesus gives his answer. And these Pharisees, they give their answer. And their answer isn't based on any kind of knowledge at all. It's based on just wicked accusation. They're like, I mean, really actually displaying that for all eternity now recorded in the words of God in the Bible, right? They're, they're displaying how they actually are sons of the devil, how the devil is their father. The devil, the word devil means accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. And what are they doing? You're born in sins. That's what they say. Accusing him. Like, exactly like their father, who is a liar and the father of lies, who is a murderer. They want this man to not go to heaven. They're going to kick him out of the synagogue for testifying to Jesus. So they're lying about him. They want to destroy him. And they accuse him wrongly because Jesus already gave his answer. Neither this man nor his parents sinned to cause this. They say he's a sinner. He was born in sins. That's it. If, if they had heard the disciples ask the question, who sinned this man or his parents? They would have been quick to answer the disciples and say, surely both this man and his parents caused this condition. But thank God for the light of Jesus. Thank God for the love and truth of Jesus. Thank God that though the man was cast out of the synagogue, he was not cast out of the kingdom of heaven. They cast him into the street, but they could not cast him into the outer darkness. No, they could not. I'm reminded, as I was looking at this, I'm reminded of this place in London. It's my probably my favorite place in London, when I'm able to go there, I, I always like to just visit. It's, it's a place called Bun Hill Fields. And it's, it's actually a cemetery. It's, it's where John Bunyan is buried and, and uh, uh, Thomas um, Brooks, I think. Oh, was he buried there? There's a lot of Puritans. Susanna Wesley is buried there. Isaac Watts is buried there. John Owen is buried there, right? A who's who of Puritans. And what's really interesting about that place that burial grounds, uh, Bun Hill Fields, there's actually, it's crazy, like, if you look at this sanctuary that we're in right now, Bun Hill Fields is only about the size of, like, maybe 10 of these, right? Pretty small uh, for, I mean, not, it's not even the size of the school grounds. Much, much smaller than the entire school grounds. Maybe, maybe 10 of these sanctuaries. There's 180,000 people buried there. They're buried, like, 10 deep, okay? The way that they would dig those graves, and I only know because I talked to the curator of the cemetery there, and they would dig the graves and bury families one on top of the other. 180,000 people. And, uh, and that, that burial grounds was actually the nonconformist cemetery. So what that meant is that the Anglican church, which was in charge from the time of Henry VIII onward, that... Those who were buried in Bunhill Fields are the ones who the Anglican bishops were saying 
are not going to go to heaven, right? Bunyan and Owen and Watts and <laughs> all of my heroes. <laughs> I've told Taylor when I die, she needs to, you know, sneak me in there and bury me next to Bunyan so I can give him a high five at the resurrection, you know. <laughs> Look at that. It's like, it's kind of what's happening here. Cast him out. You're not going to go to heaven. You're not going to take part of the life of the nation of Israel. You're cast out. And the reality is, is that he's one of Christ's sheep. At the end of this chapter, as we'll see the next time we study it, at the end of this chapter, we're going to see Jesus comes and he finds the man. And he, he speaks to the man. Oh, let's just read it. We'll, we'll, we'll go further in depth when we come back together. But let's just finish by, by reading this because it's so great. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. I think in that moment, all oh, any kind of trepidation or fear that he would have had about the judgment of man or 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 being cast out and maybe disappointing his parents who didn't want to be cast out of the synagogue. And, and all of that had to just vanish away. It just had to vanish away. He met the lover of his soul in the flesh. You have seen him. You have seen him. Seen with the eyes. Jesus is saying, Ooh, I don't want to steal my own thunder. Listen now, Jesus is saying, you have seen him with the eyes that he gave you. You've seen him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, therefore, your sin remains. Do you have Jesus? Do you trust in Jesus? If you do, then you have all you need. We have, uh, what have I in heaven but you, Asaph says. And the earth has nothing that I desire except for you, Lord. I have everything I need in the Lord Jesus. What a remarkable story this is of a man who stood on the truth. We need to be willing to stand on the truth. For uh, There's also a sense, even, even if... Uh, our physical eyes were not given to us after a, a lifetime of physical blindness. Yet, we were blind, truly blind, and now we see. And Christ has done that for all who believe in him. And since that's the case, then what that means is we must look at this man as a pattern for how we are to live, to stand on Christ, no matter what the cost, to stand on his truth, to proclaim his truth, even if it means that we lose everything. We stand on Jesus Christ. We stand on the truth of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus the light of the world to shine in our hearts and to open the eyes of our heart to believe, to see you. I thank you so much for the story of this blind man. Not only the miracle that you do in his life, but also the incredible stand that he takes, even against those who would, would have been so intimidating to him. But 
He had all that he needed. He knew all that he needed to know. That he was once blind, but now he sees. And we also have everything that we need as well in Jesus, in your word, the Bible. We're so grateful for that, Lord. We ask now that you would help us to stand. Help us to stand in a world that is more and more acting like these Pharisees. In a world that rejects the truth, hates the truth, will not listen to the truth, wants to suppress the truth more now than ever before, perhaps in at least America's history, more now than ever before. They want to destroy the truth. But what else can we do? All we can do is stand on it. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you for bringing your people here today. Thank you for this word to our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I think it's only appropriate that we sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> I think I think so. Let's stand. I don't know what, what the number is for me. 402. See, Calvin knew that right away. He didn't even need to look it up, man. Let's turn in our, in our hymn books to hymn number 402. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many days Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. May God be with you all.